as said, we're starting slowly today and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are in the different time zones and different uh, places um, in this uh, world of ours. And uh, today's uh, session is an exploratory paper session on uh, more than spoken participation. And um, we're going to have three uh, very interesting papers, and I'm so happy to be chairing this session. Um, and the, the first one will be uh, Modalities of Participation, Designing Beyond the Verbal uh, by Kara Wilson and Kelly Morrissey. And we have Kara here uh, with us. Uh, the second will be Artful Material Utterance, a core competence for participatory designers by Andy Durden, and Andy is with us here. And uh, the last uh, is Emergent Participation in the Do-It-Yourself Design Bike Trails by Liam Haley and Peter Galco. And Liam is here with us today. So um, I think we can um, officially start now. And as uh, per the practice, of PDC 2022, uh, I'll start with an acknowledgement and uh, I'll start by presenting myself in, um, in Arabic and Finnish and will then say uh, a, little, uh, a little bit of the acknowledgements then in English. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joanna Saad-Rani. So, مرحبا it me Joanna and I've been to La Salim Jorsad. Hey, Ole Joanna, Aun Tudar. Through my pop, uh, multicultural and multi sided roots, uh, I want to acknowledge the nature and the people of Finland, Lebanon, and Palestine, and pay my respects to the struggles of my parents and grandparents in the many wars and displacements that took place in the previous centuries in Europe and in the Middle East. I also acknowledge the different forms of oppression still present in these lands and the fact that I get lost in their many entanglements. When I look from my window uh, right now, I have the privilege to see trees. I can also hear birds singing and I can breathe clean air. And I give thanks to the people of Denmark where I'm currently located that made this possible. But I also acknowledge the links of the land to colonization and the ongoing struggles of indigenous populations, as well as those of refugees. So welcome, welcome, bienvenue, tervetuloa, ahlan, ahlan, everybody, to this great session at PDC 2022. So uh, as you all probably know, um, it's very important for us that PDC remains this um, safe space for all of us to share and come with our own uh, particularities and differences and positions. So please be kind and mindful during the session. And uh, we welcome uh, critique, of course, that's what we want but please be, make it constructive and be careful in your choices of words, uh, for example. And um, just to let you know that this session uh, is recorded. So if you want to stay anonymous, please uh, turn your camera off and de-identify yourself on Zoom. And uh, we welcome, as always, everybody to share uh, their own acknowledgements of uh, tradition, custodians, and lands uh, by using uh, the Zoom chat box. Uh, so without further ado, we're gonna start with the first presentation uh, uh, by Kara Wilson of Modalities of Hi, everyone. Patient. Designing Beyond the Verbal, please. Let's roll the video. Hi everyone, I'm Kara Wilson and today my colleague Kelly Morrissey and I 
will be presenting our exploratory paper on modalities of participation designing beyond the verbal. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders, past and present, of the Turrbal and Yugera peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands where this work was originally conducted, also known as Brisbane, Australia. Participatory design approaches strive for inclusion and empowerment in the process of design, no matter the experience or abilities of participants. In practice, however, conventional PD methods can be inappropriate for those who communicate in non-verbal or more than verbal ways, which leads to design methods which are exclusionary, imbalanced and unjust. Commonly, PD methods require participants to verbally contribute, to brainstorm, to debate and be questioned on their feelings regarding designs. Such participation is considered demonstrable in that it is easily documented in written accounts and researchers can then infer a certain degree of participation is occurring. However, what happens in contexts where participants communicate in non-traditional ways, where verbal communication is not the primary mode of expression? This paper asks what participation looks like when we place value on modalities of expression that are beyond the verbal. Responding to PDC 2022's Senti Pensar theme, we ask, how can we better attune to different forms of expression in a socially just way? How do we value these, even if they are somehow difficult to describe, but somehow felt? There's a growing body of work concerned with understanding participation beyond the verbal. For example, Kia Hook's Soma Design. And our work follows on from others in HCI who call for increasing attention to be paid to multimodal, multisensory and embodied ways of knowing and design. One such piece of work is the Modalities of Self-Expression Framework, which my colleagues Laurie-Anne, Bernd, Jeremy, Margot and I developed in an attempt to better understand the various forms of expression and participation at play in the development of a tangible wall technology in the context of participatory design with minimally verbal children on the autism spectrum. So here we propose six modalities of self-expression, which researchers can attune themselves to. These include sounds, bodily movement, touch and gesture, words, play and creativity. We included words here as a modality because some of our participants use limited words, phrases or utterances to communicate in design sessions. Although these usually weren't generative, but rather repetitions or scripts. Each modality, um, which we've discussed here, can, can be of a fundamental or of an integrative nature. So integrative modalities, which are creativity and play, employ combinations of the fundamental modalities, which are words, sounds, bodily movement, touch and gesture. The framework is only a starting point for understanding expression um, in these contexts, and it's non-exhaustive. There are more details in, um, in the PDC paper and in the original CHI 2020 paper, which is referenced here. This paper was conceptualised when Kelly and I began talking about more than verbal participation in design. Kelly observed that what my colleagues and I had been outlining in the modalities of self-expression framework, um, while in the context of children and autism, was reflected in her observations and experiences in designing for dementia care. We decided to look into this in more detail. So we revisited Kelly's Dementia Care Design Ethnography data and retroanalyzed it through the lens of the modalities of self-expression framework. And this was in order to understand whether these modalities translated to any other beyond verbal contexts. The ethnography from which this data is drawn was carried out in uh, three Irish long stay and daycare homes for people with dementia over the course of three years. These ethnographic engagements led to the development of a prototype technology Sway the Band, which is a series of batons which are pre-programmed to light up and switch colour to the beat of music playing in the background. The prototypes were adapted into a series of music sessions at the care centres, and I'll now pass over to Kelly for her reflections. The following excerpts from our paper illustrate how careful attention to minimally verbal communication from participants can nevertheless be understood as participation and therefore unfolded into longer term participatory design processes. Veronica was a day resident who had progressed dementia. She was introspective and religious. She carried keepsakes on her person, a set of rosary beads coiled in her pocket, a small book of religious poetry with a leather cover purchased on a trip to Lourdes with her family several years earlier. She would often take out these items and run her fingers through the pages or through the beads. She did this during stressful situations, when the group in the care centre was playing a game she couldn't quite grasp, or when she was seated near unfamiliar people. Early on in getting to know her, we were sitting together in the parlour of the day centre, listening to music. 
On the TV was an instrumental version of an Irish ballad. Suddenly, Veronica reached her hand out to take mine and guided my hand in an elaborate dance to the music for a minute before bringing it to her face and kissing it softly. She laid my hand down and we resumed listening to music together. This early interaction with Veronica indicated to me that any resulting design should make use of touch and tactility. It made me think about how important religion was for my participants, as were small, meaningful objects which could be touched and rubbed to self-soothe. Most of all, it highlighted to me the expressive possibilities of hand-holding and dance, even if that dance was limited to staying in our seats. Some residents traced out the anxiety of being in the care home in bodily ways. One resident, Una, walked the halls incessantly, her brow furrowed, her hands clasped behind her back, her eyes downcast. Residents grew irritated as she weaved between their chairs to try the handles of the windows behind them. Strange behavior like this was seen as disruptive by many residents. And though Una's anxiety manifested itself in these quiet ways, the way she interacted with her environment disrupted the quiet and polite status quo. Una's wandering was in part motivated by a sense of dislocation she felt in the care centre. In opening the window, she told us she was trying to see if her family cat needed to be let in. At the same time, she knew she was not at home anymore, that the cat was not there, and that she was surrounded by unfamiliar people. Una's wandering highlighted that many residents in care are living in separate realities as their condition progresses or as they get used to life in the unit. It also indicated that these realities could intersect and clash. As a result, I oriented to design within contexts that promoted togetherness or shared experiences. I also knew I wanted to create something that flattened the hierarchy of differences that residents were experiencing in living, often involuntarily, together near the end of their lives. Props were often used to encourage participants to interact with one another. For instance, ribbons and ropes of cloth were stressed, stretched across the four to five meter diameter of the seated circle in the care center, supporting participants to connect with one another and dance without leaving their seats. During one session, the participant NASA deviated from swaying gently with the rope in time to that's amore, instead flicking it at her partner like a whip and laughing hard. She then moved her grip along the length of the rope, a look of intense, but playful concentration on her face, miming a struggle of tug of war with her partner. Events like these made clear the value of props in dementia care to allow fun and improvisation. Careful observations of NASA indicated to me the range of possibilities that design might allow in design for musical expression in dementia care, from soothing, gentle swaying to playful provocation of a partner, along to a sense of competition via a tug of war. This made me think that such a design here might serve more than one purpose, not just to unite a group to sway peacefully together, but to interact in unexpected ways with one another without using words. If you're interested in finding out what we designed as part of these studies, please check out these papers. And now I'll hand you back to Cara. So in responding to our opening question on what participation might look like beyond the verbal, our rereading of the ethnography suggests that it might look like touch, for example, hand-holding, bodily movement, for example, wandering or positioning the body, words, even if these are infrequent, play, such as chaining actions together with a partner, and creativity in situ, for example, singing, painting and improvising, and sounds, such as those meant to spur, uh, spur on others or invite participation. So in the interest of time, I'll just touch on another one of our main reflections, which is valuing the feltness of participation. The idea that people have only participated if they've done so in ways which we, the researchers, can recognise, describe, analyse, quantify and report is reductionist at best and harmful at worst. We suggest a readjusting of what we value in PD as demonstrated participation and its associated reportings, in line with Anne Light's discussions on the writing of PD. If we value PDC's senti pensar mentality, then we value otherness in ways of knowing. The feltness of participation should be valued, even if it poses issue for the scientific method and current conceptualizations of empirical evidence. These should be boldly nudged and should be questioned in the name of progressing design research. 
Overall, this work has aimed to highlight the value of critically attuning to other forms of expression and participation in PD work. I'll wrap up there. Um, if you'd like to discuss anything further, please do get in touch with Kelly and I at the emails you can see on screen there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kara uh, and Kelly. And uh, we have Kara here with us. So if anyone wants to ask a quick questions, we have five minutes so we can dedicate for that. Um, I'll check quickly in the chat. Um, if there's someone there or if someone is so brave as to uh, say the question out loud, please uh, take this hint to do it now. If, uh, if not, then I have a quick question uh, for you, Kara. Uh, in your paper, um, you, you mentioned uh, that in order to understand a person's modality of participation, the researcher must make themselves malleable, flexible, and moldable to the participant-led process. Uh, then you add that in order to feel participation of others, we first need to feel out our own participation. And I find this very inspiring, uh, but also very difficult to, to start engaging with. So I would like to ask, can you open a bit this up or, or give us your, your take on, on, you know, how can we start feeling our own participation? Yeah, thanks, Joanna. I think that's, it's a really, hard thing to know how to do and I think that's something that's almost a, um, a case by case basis of the way that you might feel participation for example in the work that I was doing with, with children on the autism spectrum might feel different from the way that Kelly was doing it with her design ethnography um, and I think it really will it's really highly contextual and highly subjective obviously because it's relating to feelings um, so I guess just having a good sense of who of, of how what we bring when we move into participatory design spaces or, or spaces that we are setting up to be those that are for participatory design and um, having a sense of what it is that what we're bringing to it um, and our own opinions or our own biases etc um, which are really hard to keep in mind when you want to go to say for example a busy school and work with them um, amazing children who are so engaging um, it's really hard to remember that even if you are in that moment you feel like you're <clears throat> being moldable or malleable or you're being led maybe even physically by the hand by children or by in the examples people with dementia um, that you're you're still not fully um, opening yourself up to that perhaps I mean that uh, yeah I think it's, it's basically just a, a bit of a um, a prompt to think about things that way, but I don't think there's any one simple answer and it will really depend on each person's individual practice, but certainly thinking about those things in detail and, and a bit of reflection or yeah, sort of pre-reflection and thinking about your positionality before you go into these spaces, which as you say is really difficult and tiring and um, um, challenging sometimes, but I think it's it's worth, worth doing. I don't know if that really, it's not a full, it's really not something that I think we can, no, I, I think it's, it's very individualized, really. yeah. Thank you so much, Kara. I see we have two questions. We will only take one more now and please, uh, so I will take the one um, in the chat. So Liam, I will leave yours, uh, if you can leave yours for, for the, the end of the session. So um, Joyce is, is saying, thank you, Kara and Kelly, interesting paper in selecting the various props where they chosen based on uh, observation of the people and their own way of interaction and where other props introduced at different times depending uh, on the mood of the group mm. so you can see the, the question in the chat Kara uh, as well okay I think um so Kelly is unfortunately not able to be here today and that's her ethnography um so I wouldn't want to comment on exactly how she did that. I'm sure it was very nuanced. And I think from reading her papers from before, the two Kai papers that she mentioned, it was very um, sort of person-centered in the way that they chose which props to use and when to employ them. But I would say for that, I don't want to um, 
say the say the wrong answer there. So I would say to look at her two papers that she wrote about that specifically about that prototype and the sort of run up to it and developing it, which were two Kai papers. And um, I can try to put the links in the chat if you'd like to have a read of them. Great. Thank you so much for the questions and thank you Claire, for for being here and, and answering the questions. For everybody else, please keep your question to uh, the end of the session. So after we have all the presentations done. So next one in line is, is Andy uh, with his presentation. Um, uh, Artful material utterance, a core competence for participatory designers. And we'll have the video running. In keeping with the practice of this conference, I want to acknowledge the many custodians who have shaped this place over thousands of years. In particular, I want to acknowledge the wealthy Quaker philanthropists who helped establish this beautiful garden village area, but also acknowledge the farmers who grew the cocoa and the sugar, some slaves, some as bonded labourers in West Africa and the Caribbean that made the chocolate that helped to amass that wealth. Okay, so this paper is about saving a hedge, actually this hedge, but I don't want to talk to you about hedges or hedgehogs. Now, I don't know why you come to the Participatory Design Conference, but I come to learn about understanding PD and how I might do it better. And I find that's a bit tricky because I'm not sure what I should focus on in order to do PD better. How should I evaluate my own performance, my own skills? At the conference, I'll learn about new ideas for activities I could include in projects. People present new ways of stimulating design or engaging with different kinds of groups. And I learn new critical perspectives on the political and social context of PD. But what I feel I'm lacking is a clear way to assess my own performances, whether that's retrospectively after a session or at the end of a project or in the, the moment of actually doing PD. I mean, I can say, yes, this workshop is going well or that group of people are really engaging with that activity or that person looks uncomfortable. I wonder what's going on. But I don't have a systematic framework for looking at my own performance. So I want to go back to basics and I want to talk about talking, or at least I want to communicate about communicating. Actually, there's a whole field of study that looks at talking about talking. It's called pragmatics and it's a subfield of linguistics. And a key concept in pragmatics is the idea of an utterance. Because an utterance is not just about the words we use, like the idea of a sentence, but it's the situated action in which we are saying something. Who are we speaking to? What's the history of that conversation? We need to attend to the tone of voice and the pauses and the breathing. Because it ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it. So if I want to improve my skills at PD, perhaps I should focus on material utterances. Because we don't just say things and listen to people saying things in PD. I and colleagues make things. We manipulate materials. We encourage others to manipulate materials to communicate with us. My PD practice, and actually any kind of collaborative design practice, is composed of conversations made up of sequences 
of material utterances. So what is a material utterance? In this short chat, I only want to say a couple of things. One is that a material utterance is a communicative action. It's an event in social interaction, and it's going to be interpreted against social norms and expectations. We can think in terms of familiar language games or speech genres, genres of communication. Handing over a blueprint is one such genre of communication in designing. But unlike the words used by Humpty Dumpty, my material utterances are going to mean what the receiver, the listener, the audience decide they mean. I can never be certain of what that's going to be in advance. But just like when I'm writing an email, and I use my knowledge of the addressee to imagine how the message might be received and adapt my text accordingly. I try to be artful with my words. We can also adapt our material utterances to what we understand about other participants. In these material utterances, my colleagues were trying to discover why people had come to particular events. One was conducted at a Christmas fair run by Makerhood, which is a network of makers and artists in South London. The other was at the Leeds Community Clothes Exchange. The questions were similar, but the utterances were adapted to make them meaningful for those different audiences. Now my second point is that although material utterances has material components to which skilled designers and makers can make an important contribution, the effectiveness of the utterance is not an intrinsic property of the material forms. It's about presenting the right object to these specific listeners at an appropriate time and in the right way. The object is just one aspect of the whole material utterance, but it's the utterance that needs to be performed in an artful way. I remember facilitating a workshop with colleagues where we gave people a piece of A2 paper and asked them to draw a timeline to illustrate the story of a previous project. I then went on to suggest that they draw a line across the middle of the paper. But my colleague interrupted me to stop me being so directive. I'm so pleased that she cleared up my clumsy utterance because the responses we got were so much richer because we'd left the task more open. So here's a diagram with some boxes and arrows. In the paper I discuss some of the material utterances I made while trying to save that hedge. And I analyse them with reference to this framework. I don't necessarily want to say that those utterances were particularly artful. Some were more artful, some were less so. And I don't necessarily want you to adopt this framework. But next time we're reflecting on a PD activity, let's try focusing on specific material utterances to make sense of our performance and maybe do it better next time. Thank you. Thank you, Andy for a thought-provoking presentation and article. And once again, I will ask uh, if anyone wants to, to, to uh, ask a question right now for Andy, we have five minutes uh, dedicated for that. So you can uh, type it on the chat or be brave and just say it. And you can also raise your hand uh, with the Zoom feature for it, so I can see you. So, does someone want to ask Andy something at this moment?
if not, uh, I have also my question for Andy, and uh, it's uh, it linking a bit to to what I asked Kara before. And Andy, you uh, in your paper and also in your presentation, um, you 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 you're saying how sometimes we um, we do pre prepare for uh, for these material utterances that that you're talking about by making the artifacts, setting the space in a particular way, etc. But I'm interested in hearing a bit more about when um, these uh, we are in these mo what you call these moment by moment interactions. And uh, and the material utterances are chosen there in the moment. So where we are and have in a way to, to react maybe to what's happening. So um, a bit, you know, taking this senti pensar approach that, that was put forward by Kara. So I'm wondering, Andy, do you have something to, to say about it? And I'm particularly thinking of, you know, students who ask us, how do we do participatory design? And it's these kinds of moments that are difficult to explain, so. Yes, uh, and, and those moments are, I guess, about being, being mindful. I, I really, I mean, I know that Sometimes I do things and I, I really, sometimes I do them wrong um, and, and, they're, and they're not effective and trying to, and, and being outside of myself, trying to look in on my, you, you know, that's not necessarily going to work. I found the session yesterday, I was listening to Laura Gottlieb who was talking about relational sensitivity, which was, she was, sorry, they were working on um, sort of developing Anne, uh, Anne Light and uh, Yoko Okama's ideas about poise and punctuation. And I, I think these things are all closely related. And, and what Kara was saying, I can, I can absolutely see why uh, what Cara and Kelly were were talking about, and what I'm talking about, sort of fit, and I, I sort of feel, sort of watching that presentation, thinking, oh wow, you know, I wish I'd read all that stuff before I made that presentation because I just sound so kind of ignorant after you know just <laughs> listening to that. So yeah, I don't know. Um, for for me. It, we can be more reflective and all i'm suggesting with this idea of material utterance is is a way of, of bringing a little focus to a, a, a tiny piece to help us in that process but you know there's many many pieces to this jigsaw thanks andy i think it's an extremely useful concept that you're bringing to us we have two minutes, so we can go quickly over a question by Anne, who's uh, thanking you, Andy, and also saying that evaluation has to focus somewhere. What do you think about what uh, gets included or left out? Yes, evaluation has to focus somewhere, and I suppose it depends on Okay, evaluation at the center of that is, is this word value. And it's about the different values that you take and the different perspectives you take. So at the end of a workshop or a, some activity, one of the things is, well, what, what are the important values that we're concerned about within this, this activity and if this activity is is part of a learning program part of an education program then perhaps the the central values are the performance of the the people who are in that learning program if 
if this is part of uh, a, an activist project in which you're trying to uh, get more people engaged, then you might come at the evaluation with, with that lens. So the lenses depend on on the values that are that are uppermost and and yeah what gets included is is reflects what is being valued and uh yes and then there's you know that that classic thing i i, I end up going back to that classic thing that that everything that you know, just because something can be counted you know doesn't mean it counts and not everything that counts can be counted so i, I don't know thank you andy very much so we'll continue and next we have uh, liam's presentation so emergent participation in the way yourself design by the trails My name is Liam and in this video I'm going to give a brief summary of the exploratory paper Emergent Participation in DIY Designed Bike Trails, which will detail some early findings from research we've been doing with trail builders. First, I'd like to acknowledge the long history of traditional owners of the land around the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania, where parts of this research took place, and to acknowledge the ongoing colonial histories of the second research setting in Denmark, and where I'm based in the UK. To give a very brief introduction to the research setting, trails for BMX and mountain bikes are dirt tracks and jumps designed, built and maintained by hand by small communities of trail builders. Many of them are built in secret, often on private land without prior permission from landowners, meaning they can be precarious, fragile and are often bulldozed and illegalized, much to the distress of the local builders. On the screen are two of the sites that I will mainly focus on in this paper. On the left is Posh Woods, that with its sister site Catty has been in Pennsylvania for around 25 years. And on the right is Holman Dirt, which has been just outside the anarchist commune Freetown Christiania in Denmark since the late 1990s. Importantly, both of these spots are now legitimized and do not need to be kept secret. In looking at these spots, I'll draw on scholarship on the commons to describe the kinds of participation they are the upshot of. And this will provide three key takeaways. One, the end users of the space already have a direct influence on its implementation and use, offering an interesting and novel setting for PD to learn from. Two, that some forms of participation are severely constrained due to the spot's illegal and fragile status, which reminds us that participation or perhaps the wrong kinds of participation can also be a threat to certain communities. And three, that as some spots change in legal and political status, locals have begun to develop ways of increasing participation by adjusting the architecture of the space, as well as developing new practices, and in our view, becoming emergent participatory designers. So part one, non-participation in the uncommons. As alluded to in the introduction, the notion of the commons helps us to think of these spaces and the ways they emerge from DIY self-determined communities by using appropriated land. But as Brian from Posh sets out below, participation in the commons of trail spots has been highly policed. He told me, you didn't go down there unless you knew somebody or you got the okay from somebody. The local builders at Posh have in the past sought to exclude users from outside the core local community, often by way of intimidation, as well as keeping them secret and hidden. However, Carly, who we will later find out was one of those excluded by these practices, offered some nuance to this and could sympathise with the protectionism. She says, when trails get ploughed, people's lives stop for a long time. Something died. They lost something that they invested so much into. When people are so protective of trails and people coming in is because of that experience of loss. So the problem that Carly describes is that too much participation could potentially bring unwanted attention and jeopardize the future of the spot. These practices of exclusion begin to echo Garrett Hardin's famous The Tragedy of the Commons, which is often cited as a precursor to neoliberal politics, who argues that the protection of private property and the enclosure of commons is in the best interests of the population. 
But one of the problems with this definition is that commons are not only a set of collective resources, but ongoing formations of relations by a community that almost always involve some sort of governance. Meaning, though the commons are technically open, there are always certain rules to be adhered to, for example, so that the land would not be overwhelmed. So the commons in this case is being actively produced on appropriated land by the community that is semi-open but requires ad ad adherence to certain behaviours. But there are clearly some problems with the kinds of exclusion that Brian described before. The spaces are often dominated by white cisgender men who have historically excluded women. For example, Carly told me a story of going to Poshwoods in the early days, saying, I went with my brother, I had no intentions of riding, but I bought my bike because we were on a trip, and the locals all looked at me like, why is she here? This echoes other scholarship in punk and DIY. For example, the skateboarding scholar Dai Abu Alahawa has explained that calls to maintain the sport's core values has largely been about ensuring that legitimate skateboarders, which typically refers to a predominantly white male positionality, are able to maintain control over skateboarding culture. Therefore, these spaces provide a thorny discussion point whereby participation is viewed as potentially damaging, forcing us to consider the merits of exclusion and restriction, but at the same time to critique the ways it sits along dominant patriarchal lines. There are arguably several instances where, whereby exclusion is necessary in order to protect spaces, for example, sacred or natural spaces, or perhaps to rewild damaged land. But in addition to this, in the trail building community, we can also see new initiatives that actively look to exclude to include. For example, women's and gender non-binary events, whereby underrepresented groups are centred, which we'll go on to further in the next section. So there's been something of a change of the guard in recent years, and interviewees have described a change whereby the communities are carefully developing ways to be inclusive toward a broader range of users. <clears throat> Part of this comes with a shift in the main locals. They perhaps get older or less able to ride and are worried that the spot might die out. As Carly explained to me, there's this fear that there's going to be a disconnect that when this group of legendary trail builders are all done, who's going to come up and take over the trails? So our interlocutors have gone on to describe actively organizing and redesigning spots, jumps and lines so that it might become more open to new publics. And many of the locals have found that they need to involve different and more of the community so that, so that the spaces themselves can be made sustainable. Brian described how there's been a shift where they now are trying to encourage people to join the spot so that it can be made more sustainable, saying, I think you've got to put the beacon out there. And we've been trying to do that and be making it more accessible and more inviting to younger people, to women, to girls. Theros from Holman Dirt explained that after much internal debate, they decided to form a union so that they could apply for funding from the local municipality in order to, to expand their spot and include more people by providing free access to bikes and maintenance equipment. He said, from the start, we didn't want to get picked up by the commune too much. But then, you know, if we do it like that, you don't get to grow. You don't get to get really good facilities. It was hard for the community to resolve because you get different factions. You get a faction that want to keep it low, and then you have the faction with me where we wanted to go for the stars. He also explained that this led to tensions within the community whereby some felt that the punk and DIY roots of the space were being replaced with more mainstream administration and organization. And in the immediate aftermath, many members of the community began to drop out. The bearers also explained that numbers have now increased from around 40 before the spot was legitimized to roughly 300 now. But of course, some exclusion is somewhat inevitably baked into the sport because the architecture of the spaces, the jumps and features, so on, require certain skills and daringness to participate. Beros also explained to me how they have begun to adjust the architecture by building specific features in order to welcome a broader community. For example, they recently built a pump track deliberately positioned so that it is visible from a path running alongside the trails in a public park in the hope that young people and parents will see it and want to get involved. This has shifted to not only staging events, but to redesigning the space then. Carly went on and suggested that it is important to build spots in a way that they can be perceived as welcoming and open to broad publics. Suggesting, if you make a spot that's public, I think the first thing you should see when you come in is a pump track, because you'll see parents riding with kids on striders on the same obstacle. And that's very comforting to anybody. There's no way they can hate that pump track. 
Similarly, at Posh, Brian explained that they have recently built a small and safe beginner's line, and another local tavern recently built a line called The Secret Garden, where newer riders can practice without feeling that they are on show to avoid the intimidating sense of performativity or feeling like they're being watched or judged by more experienced riders. So in the spirit of an exploratory paper, we come to a slightly unconventional conclusion, which hopefully points to opportunities for conversation at the conference. The first is to think about how to engage with trail spots symmetrically, where we can not only learn from them, but also find ways that PD could contribute to the local communities. Building on this, I find the notion of the uncommons could become a really helpful tool to understand how spaces such as woods and forests can become part of what Plaisir and de la Cadena call a more than human uncommons. Third, taking a capitalist realist approach to these spots, these spaces also suggest some ways that wildness could be supported and made politically and economically viable over other damaging practices such as agriculture or logging. And finally, we've also identified some other spaces where forms of emergent DIY participatory design may exist. And we're excited to think through the ways that the PDC community could continue to engage with these. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Liam. Does anyone have a, a question for Liam before we move on to, to um, kind of uh, questions for everybody, for all the, the presenters? Don't hesitate to take the mic and ask. I see Andy is, is asking. Andy, do you want to say it out loud? Yeah, I, was, I'm not familiar with this term, the, the uncommons, and I just wondered whether you could, you know, Give me a, a 101 on it. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, yeah, sure. This is, I, it's, I guess, a slightly tough question. I guess in my reading, I see, I suppose the way I'm kind of thinking with that concept is that it's um, seeing a, a space that kind of holds together through difference, if that makes sense, and, and, and kind of relations that sort of, um build through through difference um i don't know if that is a a, a great summary or <laughs> but that's kind of how i'm trying to understand um these spaces like how can we kind of um see where those differences actually kind of hold together and bring and bring a community together and how can they uh how they sort of um hold together and, and contribute to each other into sort of a, a broader collective, if you like. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll go, so and, I, I'll go and do some reading. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's a, <laughs> I'm sure it's a bad explanation. Thank you both. And uh, there's a question by Vicky who's saying, uh, hi Liam, lovely presentation. Could you talk a little bit more about other do-it-yourself participatory design communities? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so th there's, I think we're really interested in, um, so for example, kind of urban gardening, um, and the sort of maintenance practices that go along with that, I think is a really interesting avenue. Um, I know lots of, uh, I, there's, there's a lot of research happening on skateboarding, which I find really interesting. Um, but very little of it has actually looked at the the sort of production. Um, it, there's there's been lots of kind of theoretical takes on the kind of production of space within skateboarding, but very little on um, from 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 the kind of perspective of of the community kind of engaging with the community. It's quite often it's sort of taking a retrospective view on what skateboarding has done in the past. Um, but I think there's some quite interesting spaces there um that have st that have started to emerge in a similar vein to these kind of the diy trail building spaces um and i think they have very similar issues um as well uh yeah so that th there's a couple there <laughs> That's... thank you 
I think we can open the space now for questions to, to all presenters, but I will start with, with the question to, to Liam as it's one that <laughs> has, uh, has appeared on, on the chat. So um, it's Maxine uh, uh, who says that the uncommons, the others are usually forgotten or ignored when it comes to factionalism and being heard. As a researcher, how have you personally managed to be quote unquote neutral and not contribute to worsening the tragedy mm. of the commons in the context of participation? That's such a good question. Um, it's it's quite it's been quite tricky because and partly I mean I think Danny Avalhawa's work on skateboarding is, is super interesting here because it's very difficult to. Um, to, to access a lot of these communities. I mean, I, I kind of um, used to do this when I was younger, so I sort of have various connections to, to those communities from years and years ago that, I, that I've been able to draw on. But it's been quite difficult to, um, for example, to, to speak to women who um, perhaps don't want to talk to me um, or, I mean, and, and are like underrepresented in these spaces. Um, so I don't think I have, first of all, I don't think I have maintained a position of neutrality um, and didn't necessarily seek to in the beginning, um, but trying to find voices that are really underrepresented in these in these spots um, and and see and see if they do want to speak speak to us. Um, but like I say, that has been difficult it's it it requires a lot more work i mean it's it, it's quite limited the number of interviewees so far i think um i've done maybe five or six uh, interviews so far and mostly white cisgender men um because that's what the, those are the people that dominate these spots um so it was really brilliant to have uh, carly contributing um who i think could bring a a, a really interesting and different perspective into this uh, but there's way more work that uh, that I need to do here as well. Um, yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you. Um, inspired by a question that Joyce is is asking on chat, I would actually like to to ask all of of our presenters to to step in and tell us a bit of your personal um, kind of. Um, reasons or uh, why uh, did you focus on uh, what you have been focusing on so in in the case of Liam so why did you focus on trail building community and through that maybe reflect on um, this this relationship between doing PD and writing about it academically but also entering it through a personal uh, relationship I think at least in the case of Liam there is a mm. strong one but also Andy uh, who entered it together I think with his wife also in a place where where, where you are living and Kara um, maybe it was more set up in a project but also there is this this, this personal um, uh, interest that 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 comes through so maybe if if you could share your your thoughts about that um, Liam, if you want to start as we go with you, then we move to Andy and then uh, to Kevin. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think um, I, like I say, I was kind of involved in this um, when I was growing up. And then I, um, I, I, I could just had this sort of nagging ever since I did my undergraduate degree, actually, that there was something interesting going on in these spaces that that hadn't really been looked at especially through the kind of lens of um of design and participation um so that's yeah that that kind of took me to i had a a, a year's postdoc last year where i sort of had a bit of time to to focus on a new project and i thought this could be a great um opportunity to to sort of yeah just to to kind of feel out where that might be and, and where some of the interesting points might be um so like i said it's still very much in that kind of exploratory phase um I think part of the just very quickly finally and part, 
part part of my motivation was um again like looking at skateboarding scholarship and seeing how that has been um absorbed back into the community and been really helpful and beneficial to that community uh in terms of um legitimizing certain spaces and legitimizing the practices that that go on there but also in the way that skateboarding um has looked to the um academic work that's done on it to then kind of reflect back on its own practices and, and sort of absorb those back in um and make for um a, 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 a air quote better um uh, sport and way of including and, and working with people so I think that was that was the, the real motivation for me so it's a bit of a long answer <laughs> thank you what about you Andy oh it's, it's difficult to say what you know what why did I end up you know because I'm, I'm retired now and uh, why did I decide to write this up as a as a paper for PDC I think I just well I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the organization and through the PDC places and I thought well yeah you know, here's something that I haven't sort of managed to say before and somehow what I've been doing so the hedge was you know that was very personally focused but why write it up well I sort of thought well that's interesting this this is a way maybe I've got a bit more space and there's uh I think it is a problem for active academic researchers to find space to to think which is kind of a bit of a worrying context to be in but you know there's lots of things about the world at the moment that are worrying so i'll leave that thanks Andy. how about you Kara? sorry i was laughing at that andy but it's actually a very sad fact um you're right about that about the time for reflection um so yeah so in terms of the, the general context um i my family has a lot of long history of autism which is i've always had a real understanding um it um but i would say that my, my real research interest for um a couple of different um autism societies in the uk so um I was working um, full time as a um, um, support worker with lots of different people with lots of different needs and I loved it and enjoyed it so much and it was my first time working particularly with people who were non or minimally variable um, which I just thought was such a, a wonderful experience and challenging and amazing um, <clears throat> and then I chose to do my PhD on it <laughs> so it was quite a journey and I think um, what was great was that having that particular positionality is coming from being sort of professionally trained in autism support to then coming to a context where, um, you know, the, the schools that I worked in were very busy and everything was very um, sort of ad hoc and for the teachers to know that I could come and work with the children um, know that they I could you know, work with them individually and that I would be familiar with all the up to date sort of autism practices, make sure the children were safe, secure, comfortable. Um, and I guess that's sort of what I mean about this ability to draw back, to pull back all, all of your um, the self in the moment and be able to be more malleable and sort of um, flexible in a, in a context. Um, I think that most of that came from my, my pre research training in, in hands on practical work with kids on the spectrum and um, so that was really that was really great um, and what was I thinking as well yeah so I think then that this made this topic of non-verbal or minimally verbal beyond verbal participation when I was writing up my PhD just was sounding so clearly to me that this is something that really needs to be investigated further so um, yeah that's why we wrote this this paper just looking at it in different contexts from different ways because when you're writing it just for a thesis you get quite stuck in your this is the one context that it works in but actually it's really interesting to see it applied to a different context thank you so much i think it was lovely to to hear all of your your stories and entry points into the work you have generously shared with us in your papers and in the presentations today uh, I'm so sorry to have to, to stop. <laughs>
<laughs> this uh, this lovely sessions but uh, time is is not on our side but um and we have to move on i think there might be a slide showing uh, what are the next uh, sessions i'm not sure if not uh, please check them on the on the program and a very uh, heartfelt and warm thanks to everybody who has participated the the speakers the student volunteers the chairs that are here with you and all of you who have joined us here today thank you so much and have a lovely morning day or evening or night thank you thanks joanna thanks everyone thank you <laughs>